and if you would please have a have a new and start. Good day, I'm Moon. Um, I am Thamwok Sakshte, so this is a term I've created, me and some others have created for... Why do we, huh? Closer to oh, so Thamwok Sakshte, we'll get more into that um, in uh, the future, but that's generally how I like to refer to myself. It calls in line with our language. Um, and so I'm uh, currently working on my master's in indigenous politics at the University of Hawaii, where I'm uh, concerned with queer research and revitalization and uh, language uh, revitalization resurgence as well. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Ja Randolph. Um, I am black and indigenous. Um, hailing from the Dominican Republic, um, so I have some Taino, and then my father's side is African American, so I have a background of Seminole, possibly the Cherokee connections that I'm still looking into and learning uh, my genealogies for, but um, I'm just very proud to practice Afro-indigeneity in kind of everything that I do. Um, and I identify as non-binary, um, as I continue, you know, learning about both traditional um, African cultures and my indigeneity as well, I think I'll find those labels that kind of align with two-spiritedness. Um, but yeah, for right now, non-binary, gender fluid, I go by they, them pronouns. Um, and I had the pleasure of studying at Howard University. If you guys are unaware, it's one of the number one um, historically black colleges in the country. Um, and so I had just the wonderful legacy of um, working with a lot of powerful um, black elders, being informed by black queer elders in my life. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to share um, all I have with you guys today. So, yeah. thank you. Ardu Pameupe. Um, good morning, everyone. Chiriruma Kwaraku Jajai. My name is Sunshine Pindore uh, Tapuwa. I come from like South America, also known as Abia Yala Sud. Um, I also want to say, like, it's really nice to get the chance to um, express myself in this platform because I feel like throughout my life I've been like demanded to explain myself, but then. Um, when the identity or my description of myself doesn't fit or is convenient to people, they um, dis they often disrespect it. And so it's nice to have the chance to actually be able to speak on my own terms. Um, and although I like refer to myself as Paraguayan, because uh, my mom's Para from Paraguay, um, and you know I live in the United States, um, I'm not necessarily extremely proud of those identifiers because their governments were founded and continuously move in genocidal ways, uh, like their actions on October 27th when they voted against a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, and I just want to say that indigenous solidarity is also Palestinian solidarity. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, if you could just take a moment to really think about those things, you know, and just, yeah. Okay, so we can get started. Um, I really felt led to start with this little song I wrote. Um, it's in our language. Botapatana is our sacred spot. One of our sacred spots in Yanawana. It's at the Blue Hole on the University of our Continent Carnet Word Campus. And Anua means moon. Uh, Nakakawa is I love you. So there's obviously a relationship, one between Anua the moon and Botapatana. Um, which is the sacred waters. But as well, I think uh, the lesson of spirituality that I've learned from my people and the new is that the moon is ever changing from full to not being there, and it encompasses and represents this type of um, spectrum. Poto potana nu nakakawa, 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 poto potana nu nakakawa. Poto potana nu nakakawa, poto potana nu ahe neua. 
So these are my people. Uh, this is uh, our nation. Um, I'm right here. It's kind of just my you know, intro, what I'm passionate about, um, some of the work that I do, and um, yeah. Um, the place that I wanted to highlight uh, just the beginning of this conversation is in uh, the colonial mentalities regarding us. I think that it's important to recognize that we can take some things from colonizers, sadly, and that's the fact that we did exist, we were here on these lands as two spirit the most active people. Um, and so when people are like, well, what is non-binaryness? What is two-spiritness? Is this just some new internet intervent and like invention? Clearly, mm. it's not. This is Teresa de Baca. Um, an interesting thing about them as well is that, uh, so the story quickly is that they got shipwrecked along the Texas coast, um, in a, and they were able to experience natives uh, pre-contact. So my people, they were to experience them before Spanish people had got to them. And so they were able to really give a lot of amazing demonstrations of who we are, what we customs, we practice it before we encountered the Spanish. Um, and interestingly enough, when they came back to uh, Spain, they started to refer to themselves as Guadalupecans and as the other people as Spaniards. So it's really this amazing change that happened in their mentality. Um, so. During the time I spent with the people, I saw the devilish thing, and that was a man married to another man. These are Im impotent, effeminate men, and they go about covered like women, they perform the task of women, and they shoot with it or they carry great loads. I always found this last part really fascinating, and they carry very, very great loads, because it's like, are they just demonstrating that two-spirit thumb ups actually people are stronger? That's what I take from that. So, can you go to the next step? Um, so this is another demonstration. And um, <laughs> they can also be found a great number of hermaphrodites or mongo, because this word is very important, as they call them. They take these with them on their campaigns, not only to make use of them in moral ways, but in order that the hermaphrodites may drive off the horses and mules that are being stolen while they themselves attack them. So see the power. Uh, the damox. is our word for power, magic, spirit. Mm. Um, yeah, let's go to the next one, too. So this is taken from Margaret Shoots. I know that this stuff is hard to deal with, and so I just want to put it there so we know kind of our, the reality of where we're coming from. At least from my people. This term I don't like to use anymore. I think it's derogatory. And really, um, it relates to the, the word mangaguia, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so not only on the Qualitecans, but on Paranguas, Mm -hmm. All of these lands, it's clearly evident that two spirit people have been here, they will be here for the rest of the time. Um, I like to use the word amoks akshte to refer to us. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, two spirit. If y'all don't get this reference, I, heard, I highly encourage y'all to uh, listen to the song. Um, so, I just wanted to go over quickly as well what is two spirit? Where does this term come from? This is. Um, a newly created term from the 90s. Um, at one of the first queer conferences. And um, so it was, it was, in a sense for me, it's kind of like a pro political project, right? So like we exist in the realm of colonizers, categorizations and mentalities. And so in order to kind of refine ourselves in this place, and give a generalized term, we created uh, the word two-spirit. Um, and so for me, in that sense, it, represents, it doesn't represent who we actually are or who I am. Mm. It represents like a project of like, okay, we can call ourselves this in this avenue. But I encourage other people that we have to remember Nuance. Nuance is extremely important, you know. So the nuance of who your particular people yeah. thought of you as, or called you, or believed in you as, is as highly important. Which leads us to the next slide. Mm. So this term that I referred to before, mangoguias, um, mangoguias. Um, so the Karankoa actually, this is one of this word is so amazing for me because um, it is one of the only words that we have which native people created for those members in their community. Mm. And that was created by the Karankwa. As you can see, the Karankwa are our kin. They're right next to Kualitakins. And in actuality, all of these tribes right here are kin. Um, <clears throat> and so when 
people were trying to remove themselves from the term Bertache, um, they used the term two spirit and they also um, were interested in trying to research, well, what did my own people call me? So part of the issue that I face with this, um, if we go to the next slide, is that I have not been able to, and neither have other people been able to find the term for two-spirit people in Kualitek, for Kualitekans or in Pahalate. Um, for me, that is something that's sad because an aspect of our culture has been intentionally destroyed and um, removed. So part of what my research would do is to be is to see if we can reuncover those words and find them for our own people. But since we don't currently have those, and there's a long longstanding projects in which I'm engaged in, I like to use the word tamoks akshte. So the word tamoks akshte, tamoks is like I said before, our word for spirit. Akshte is our our word for two. So previously, this academic had constructed the word moks, which is two spirit. One of the things about our language is, and is that it kind of works, um, I wouldn't say backwards, but differently. Um, and so with our grammar, this for me falls more in line with the way that we actually would have said it. This is a new construction with a contemporary, and it represents a very important aspect of indigeneity, which is indigenous futures, right? Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. I want to highlight that um, our community does demonstrate in a small degree linguistically um, acknowledging other genders outside of the gender binary. So that would be our next one. So these are kinship terms. Um, the thing that's really interesting about our kinship is that, you know, to say father, if you're a woman, you would say the anje. To say, for a man, you would say like me ma. But there's this third term um, from the Rio Grande in our books, and it's Zanai. The thing that's interesting about Zanai is it also means father. And knowing my people and our history, I have an inclination to believe that this was a term created so that other Damoks mm -hmm. Akta people could say father and not have to refer to a gender. If that's not the case, at the very least, it's still a term that now can be used by us and also demonstrates that while the people were concerned with gender in that they would state, you know, let's say I'm an AMAB, but I am identifying, you know, in a more femme way, I would say, you know, the, the word for woman, which means that there's a lot of gender expression that can be demonstrated um, by reincorporating these, these types of mentalities. Um, Okay, what was the next slide? There, there's a lot to end break here because the whole system of even love, right, the whole system of everything is dependent upon this categorization by settlers. And so we, we kind of have to know a little philosophy to kind of like remove ourselves from those things, understand terms of like essentialism, uh, indigenous, Afro-indigenous futures. Um, so when it comes to this particular side, you have to think that the Spaniards, right, when they came to this land, they were incorporating a type of social structure that was dependent upon, quote unquote, some views of the Bible, but also wanted to emulate the royal authority, which is to say they had a king, a queen, and that that was the standard for families. Um, we in these lands did not work that way. We oftentimes were polygamous, and we were definitely queer, as is demonstrated before. Um, so the methodology of Spanish people when they come here is to implement this social structure, and that degrades so many things within us. And it really reconceptualizes love to us, right? So or kawa. So when we're existing in this cis-heteronormative versions of love, mm -hmm. it's really taking apart some of the most sacred aspects of how we as Pauli Beckins would have chosen to love, which is oftentimes in a poly way and a queer way. So the, the, another aspect of why this can be so destabilizing is because if we had matrilineal, matriarchal systems, tribal systems, then when people come in and they're like, hey, we're, they would say, we're only giving land and acknowledgement and power to men. And then that would destabilize the whole structure of like who had power and all of a sudden people were like, 
oh, we have to elect men to be our leaders, and that gets very confusing. Also, the way that it interacts with the spirituality and two-spirit is whenever you study shamans and two-spirit native culture, there's a type of sacredness that's attached to this. Um, and it, in my opinion, it's because there are roles, right? So some people would say, like, you know, in our tribes, um, women handled death practices, right? And so then men had a different role to handle within our tribe. So, so within the living, right? So the two-spirit person would encompass both of these realms of the dead and the living. And that would be a sacred place often that was relegated to shaman. So when you tie that together with these other antidotes that when the native Guadalupecans were forced to the missions, they were forced to be monogamous, then the people who were practicing the sacred ways, they come to the mission, the Catholics are like, um, we don't want any of that. You are supposed to be straight here, you're only supposed to have one partner, and that's the way it's gonna be. That those people, and they've done this over and over again, they did this in the Philippines, were mm. oftentimes the most sacred aspects of our culture. Those people were the ones that were holding on to the sacredness, mm. they were the ones performing the ceremony, they were the ones doing the spirituality. They did this to the people in the Philippines, they did this to Mahu in, that are, you know, Kanaka Maoli or in Hawaii. It's a continual action. And to you know, further demonstrate that this is a spiritual violence against the spirit people, mm. I would like to state that when Spanish first came to Turtle Island and they encountered the Machica, the Machica, when they saw them, they would carry huge bowls of incense and um, would have lots of smoke around them. Mm. So the Spaniard people interpreted this that they thought they were gods. That's not the case at all. And I'll give you another example. When um, Cook first landed in Hawaii, Hawaiians did the same thing to these colonizers. They were like, oh, let me give you my cloak. Let me, you know, give you smoke and uh, give you incense. The reason why indigenous people most likely did this is because they felt bad for the Spaniards and because they were very dirty. So the hygiene practices of Spaniards were that they were very not cleaning themselves. And so when the Machica encountered these Spaniards on their land, they're like, okay, we need to deal with this smelly situation. Let's get some incense. You need new clothes. Let me hook you up. And then they do that same, and the Spaniards did take the same thing in Hawaii. And they're like, oh, they must think we're gods, right? This is the arrogance of the fallen, you know? It's like, no, we we have compassion and empathy. We feel bad for you. Oh. Yeah. And, and so for me, that demonstrates these narratives that have, have gone through our, our world where it's like the Spaniards think these things and they're clearly disconnected from the reality of the situation. Um, can you go to the next slide? So this part is super important to me and something I also would like to highlight because um, part of these stories that Spaniards continue to desire to erase is, you know, centered stuff on Kawa, which is love. And that's the fact that there's a long-standing history of black and native love in our communities. One of the first tribes that was encountered by Spanish people was a black native tribe that says they're at the very top. And they encountered them, and they found them on the mouth of the Rio around there. Um, and when we are trying to understand intersectionalism, we're trying to understand uh, liberation and Afro-Indigenous futures, we should understand it's all kind of tied together that, you know, in a very poetic sense, uh, black people seeking liberation in Turtle Island and native people being victimized by the massive oppression of Spaniards came together and they fell in love and they created new societies. Those societies are here in Texas, they've been here in Texas, and their stories have been erased. So if we're talking about love, we're talking about destabilizing the system, we're talking about combating susceptible normativity because it has an oppressive aspect, we must remember that those forms of love are black and native, and we've forgotten them. Yeah. Yes, and so I'd like to ask the microphone. Um. Yeah, so um, in talking about Black Native love, that's kind of where uh, I come in. I really want to, oh, we can go to the next one. Okay. Um, I really, and uh, Anula as well, wanted to highlight um, Afro-indigeneity in this presentation because it is such a form of liberation. I think for me, kind of the 
peak of liberation has been um, Afro-indigeneity, um, accepting my neurodivergence, um, and queerness, you know? So all of these things coming together to allow me to be the best version of myself. And I think um, I've seen a lot of other people as well positively impact by allowing them selves to be their full self um, outside of the confines of what's acceptable to white society because it is so very limiting, um, so very dehumanizing. Um, and so talking about the importance of Afro-indigeneity, you know, um, I think people really like to focus on this kind of like solidarity, let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Um, but I think that that's really like kind of a shallow way to think about it. That's the, the beginning of um, our solidarity, I guess. Um, so I just wanted to highlight why it's so important. Um, Afro-indigeneity gives us the opportunity to more deeply decolonize ourselves. So this is both you know, internally and externally, um, in terms of like internally holding ourselves to um, white standards of beauty. It's never gonna go well if you're a brown person, you know? Um, and there's always going to be, you know, um, indigenous people and African people who share kind of this, um, space of being extremely beautiful but also being very much outside of the standard of what's attractive to white people you know we have a lot of similarities even in our features being that um a lot of us come from very similar environments you know along the equator and whatnot um having defined cheekbones or different face shapes um having like narrower eyes wider noses bigger lips um, and so there's always going to be, you know, indigenous folks who share those things. And so um, when we see, for instance, like Latin communities um, upholding colorism, they're also pushing themselves away from their indigeneity. Um, and then, of course, externally as well, you know, learning to treat people with more kindness, learning to undo any biases that you have towards uh, black people. Um, and same thing with indigenous people, not to say black people can't be Afro, I mean, uh, anti-indigenous, because they can. Um, and then uh, African and indigenous identities validate each other. I think this is probably one of the most important points. Um, indigenous and African practices are deeply connected. Though our methodologies may be different, we hold the same values and extremely similar belief systems. Um, in my personal experience, every time I share a traditional African belief that I'm really resonating with or feel aligns with me, I'm deeply supported and affirmed by my indigenous community and vice versa. So it's been really beautiful. I know with Guadalupe, for instance, um, just sharing different belief systems and understandings and finding out that we share those things, you know, um, that there's long-standing practices in their cultures as well. Um, and so through that, we can just kind of like tune even more into our magic by being constantly validated mm. of that magic you know it's very hard in a white society to um to feel like we are really the spiritual powerful beings that we are you know we could say like yo i made it rain today like i prayed for rain all day i needed it it was too hot i was gonna have a heat stroke and i was praying and it came you know and white society will tell us like no babes that's just the weather you know but we know our power and we have to tune into that power we have to genuinely believe um that we do have an effect on the environment around us because i mean these things are proven by um you know like quantum physics and things like that um that we have an effect um on the world around us plants can read energy you know like all of these things they talk um, even though we can't hear them and so yeah, so being validated by each other and by the fact that our practices are so similar and deeply intertwined only allows us to be more magical beings. Um, and then, of course, Afro-indigeneity expands our teachings, adding new practices and methodologies in an exchange of knowledge. Um, it's really important to think of knowledge as, um, I mean, as uh, culture as an exchange of knowledge. Um, culture is not just like, oh, we eat this thing because it's fun. Like, we eat these things because we've been practicing and learning for thousands of years how to utilize these things to make it fun, you know? Um, and so when we think of culture as an exchange of knowledge, um, 
as we're sharing our cultures with each other, we're also sharing knowledge, you know? Um, we're finding new ways to move and push energy, um, to pray, to feel more connected with our environment. Um, and so that only enriches us more. And then lastly, um, Afro-indigeneity gives us a better, fuller view of history. Um, African people have been a part of these lands since the inception of San Antonio, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've had contact with Turtle Island way before that, you know. Um, so thinking about um, African histories as part of both the histories here, uh, Mexico, Latin America, etc. cetera, um, a lot of people who are anti-black try to um, pretend that those things don't exist. Being Dominican myself, a lot of our black history is so minimized. Um, so in decolonizing ourselves, um, we're able to also have a better view of history. Um, so I wanted to talk about Afro-indigeneity in San Antonio a little bit. Um, as uh, an Afro-indigenous person myself coming to these lands, you know, it was honestly really unfortunate that I didn't see a lot of representation. There aren't a lot of black spaces still. Um, and so creating more black-led spaces uh, I think is going to be really important in all of our liberation. Um, but I also think that um, there are so many stories here, you know, Anua really like opened my eyes to this, that there are so many stories of Afro-indigeneity in San Antonio that we literally just don't hear about. Mm -hmm. So, some of these pictures. Um, this one, I believe is around 1970. This is from Fiesta Negra at um, St. Phillips College. Um, this one is, you know, Cowboy Vaquero. Um, Vicente Guerrero, um, he, it, he was the uh, president of Mexico. If you guys didn't know. So he wasn't in San Antonio, but I wanted to include him because Afro Indigenous excellent stuff. Um, and then Rebecca Clay Flores, I believe she's a commissioner. Uh, I don't know. Oh, Precinct One. Um, I think she's awesome. Um, Mario Marcel Salas is a writer um, who gave me actually a lot of the information on the next slide. And then we have the Chili Queens, uh, if you guys haven't heard about them. Um, they basically helped popularize a lot of what we consider Tex-Mex foods, um, and they were indigenous, mostly women, um, who were street vendors and who really popularized um, a lot of these foods to like white audiences. And uh, I included this picture because there's no confirmation that they're Afro-indigenous, but you know you can kind of see it in their hair. Um, and I think that one reason that you know so many of these stories are lost is funny enough, um, I think that because we share a lot of similar features, um, when we have kin, uh, you know, you can't really distinctly pull apart what features are African and what features are indigenous a lot of times. Like, we really just, like, pass, you know? Um, and so a lot of times um, people will be, you know, they'll have very indigenous features and, like, darker skin or vice versa. Um, and you know you might be able to see it a little bit in the hair and certain features, but really, I mean, I think we just kind of meld really well into like a beautiful melanated people that you know um, there's no clear distinction that shows like you know these are Afro indigenous people. And then the last picture is Anua as a baby and their daddy. Um, <laughs> so uh, just another example of like you know a real world Afro indigenous person living in uh, Yanomana who. Um, mostly identifies as Mexican, I believe. Um, but, you know, you can still see it. They still live the reality of it. Um, so, yeah, go to the next slide, please. Um, so, black people have been a part of the story of San Antonio since its inception and have faced segregation since its inception as well. So, um, a lot of people, and I'll, I'll run through these quickly, but um, the Canary Islanders, um, people talk a lot about them because they established the first chartered civilian community in Texas, and then later that year uh, created the first mu municipal government in Texas. Um, and it's really interesting because they're Spanish, they kind of like identify as Spanish, but if you look on the map here, where the Canary Islands are is much closer to Morocco, to Africa. And if we're thinking of the 1730s, the Morocco that we know today is a lot more mixed. There's been a lot of colonization from Europe. So um, 
1731, they would have been a lot uh, more brown skinned. But of course, it was still a mixed group of both like darker skin and lighter skinned Canary Islanders. So, um, yeah, the uh, darker skinned Canary Islanders were segregated <laughs> after getting here, after settling. Um, and to me, I feel like you play white people games, you get white people prizes, you know? <laughs> um, so it says, racially conscious islanders associated blacks with slavery and lower class status. Class or gastas de uh, designation established social standing and persons identified as whites were held in higher esteem than the darker Indians and blacks. Islanders' attitudes effect, reflected these views and physically dissociated themselves from the darker residents. A separate community, Villa de San Fernando, was established by the islanders on the west bank of the San Antonio River, leaving Villa de Bejar uh, east of the river as the residents of blacks, Mission Indians, and racially mixed. I was kind of interesting. And I also, this is the map here, so I think it's like also a very interesting point to use, you know, such a sacred um, spiritual river, you know, uh, but literally these like living spirit waters as a line for segregation. And so that itself is kind of its own um, spell on the land, you know? Um, um, and then we, of course, have cowboy and vaquero culture. Um, if you guys didn't know, uh, black and indigenous people were a pretty large proportion of cowboys in Texas. Um, and I wanted to highlight this, not only because we were working alongside each other, but you know, we have to think about the continual legacy of these things um, as these families maybe settled down in their own land, in rural areas, and just continued um, to mix. I spoke yesterday with um, the director of the Texas Heritage Project at AIT, um, Rudy de la Cruz, and I was asking him if he had any like readily available pictures of like clearly Afro-Indigenous people that he had scanned into the archives. And he talked about how, you know, in his own family, um, out in the ranches, like you can see, you can see that they're mixed. Um, because they just continue to mix out there. So I like to think of that as like, you know, how many stories of Afro-Indigenous love, mm -hmm. of Afro-Indigenous queerness probably existed in those spaces that we don't know about. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight was the Mascobos del Guadiguila. Um, so I just think that they're a really beautiful example of an Afro-Indigenous culture. If you guys haven't heard of them, um, they originally escaped from southern plantations. So they were uh, enslaved Africans who escaped from southern plantations in the 1600s and 1700s to go to Florida, um, which at the time was free land. Um, and they became black Seminoles, which in Spanish is Mascobos. And then uh, after the signing of the Indian Removal Act in 1830, uh, the Moscovos were removed along the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma with the rest of the Seminoles. Um, and then in July of 1850, the Moscovos fled south through what is now Eagle Pass, Texas, and settled two hours away in Nacimiento, Coahuila. So I just think they're like a beautiful story. They're very close by, um, you know, and uh, yeah, you should guys should definitely check them out. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And then talking about queer San Antonio, and you know, from the pictures you can see this was clearly an Afro-Indigenous space, and we continued to enrich uh, and liberate each other. Um, so there are plenty of queer bars uh, between the 1940s and 70s, of course, having to be like hush hush. Um, they had to fight with the May Act, which. Um, basically tried to restrict homosexual behaviors and so like crack down on queer bars and stuff. Um, and um, which is really unfortunate, of course. Um, but yeah, you can see that we still had, you know, beautiful times of just joy um, together. Um, and it just makes me think about how, you know, there are so many Afro-Indigenous queer folks whose stories, you know, um, are not going to be in history books, are not going to be in JSTOR articles. You know, they live in the photo albums and the memories of local folks, you know. Um, and so I just re really wanted to take a moment and pay homage to, you know, all of the, the ancestors, the queer ancestors who um, have existed in this space, were meaningful to their communities, were deeply loved here and you know are only existing in private photo albums and and whatnot so yeah 
And then um, I just wanted to talk about a little bit of traditional African non-binariness, um, you know, give the perspective that, again, we're like deeply connected, we share a lot of these same systems, and to any like Afro-Indigenous folks um, watching or interested, you know, you are validated on both sides, essentially. Um, so these are some examples of some Orisa, who are deities from the Yoruba um, religion and ethnic group in Nigeria. Um, and I really love them because um, they do not have a gender. You know, they are fit into these boxes of gender um, because of the way they've been perceived by Europeans. But um, in Yoruba and in Twi as well, which is um, one of the major languages of Ghana, these are both countries that a lot of um, enslaved people were taken from and have lineage to, both do not have gendered pronouns. There are no gendered pronouns in Twi, there are no gendered pronouns in Yoruba. There's literally just a pronoun for he or she or it. Um, and, um, so, uh, though the indigenous gods, Odisha, lack gender as a fixed or intrinsic uh, attribute, gender conceptions were projected onto them. Um, and then I love this quote as well, Odisha exists in the universe as divine energy and they transcend gender. Um, yeah, so basically they represent energy and though they can take on like mask or femme forms, um, they do not have a gender. So this is uh, Owatala. Uh, they were the creator of humanity. Um, they are androgynous. Um, and then there's this one here, Osumare, who is a kind of lesser known Orisa. They're actually over 400 Orisa. Um, and I think they're really beautiful ha to highlight because they're specifically the Orisa of the rainbow and of androgyny, um, which I think is just such a you know cool coincidence, um, if you want to call it that. Um, and so talking about them a little bit, Osumare is the divine rainbow serpent that connects one's destiny to the inner self through a colorful path. This powerful Orisa provides an infinite gateway of immense personal power, thus making them the Orisa of cycles, transformation, movement, Movement, balance and permanence so um, one of the reasons that they are the Orisa of, of, of androgyny essentially is because it's a combination of water which is seen as a femme element and uh, fire which is seen as a mask element coming together to make a rainbow so I think that's really beautiful and it shows like the personal power um, that we hold when we combine those two energies which align so much with two-spiritedness and yeah, so just talking about decolonizing concepts of gender, um, from my research uh, on many of our indigenous and African cultures, our concepts of gender cannot be compared to the words man and woman, because those words are deeply tied to Western social expectations in a way that our words were not. In this way, some indigenous words for what we could translate to women may be closer to the definition of AFAB, assigned female at birth, um, may have specific spiritual or cultural backstory, or may describe a specific social role or many social roles. Um, all things lost when we simply translate it to women. Um, and I think that's really important to highlight just because, you know, as folks were experiencing colonization and were being labeled by Europeans, you know, it was kind of easy to translate like what they would consider they're just AFAB, like, oh yeah, I have a vagina, I give birth to children mm -hmm. as women, like, sure, whatever, you know, not realizing the larger um, constructs that would be placed on them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we are going to go over this in a little bit. I just went to Wahoo Space. Oh. Yes. <laughs> when I, that was beautiful. That was amazing. Uh -huh. I wasn't aware of all of that. And that's beautiful. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, the the grammatical structure of tamosh, tamok, tamok, tamok ashte. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, Tupi Guarani uh, cosmology, uh, we have nye mokoi, mm -hmm. and that is spirit or voice too. So similar to tamosh, tamosh, tamok, tamoch, ashte, ashte, ashte. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very it's similar in that way. Also, my uh, my teacher, who I learn a lot of these things from, because my mom is from Paraguay. She speaks um, Alanye E, which is uh, the Paraguayan dialect of Guarani. But I don't have access to learn uh, in that way, and so I am learning through um, a different dialect, uh, Nyandewa Guarani, 
And so there's a lot, a lot of our teachings that we learn, uh, they expand over like the region. They don't just stick to like a country. Um, but I feel like through my teachings, like through learning, I, I identify mostly with that um, identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, awesome. We need to all create our own terms for our people. Okay, so this kind of ties everything together. So essentialism is a conceptualization that I would state you are a woman, this is what a woman does, and this is how a woman acts, right? Or you're a native, this is what native people do, this is how native people act. The problem with essentialism is it's always looking at a past that's never going to be able to be recreated, which is 1492. We will never be able to be go back to pre-1492. We will always be impacted by settler colonialism and the way it has affected us. So that leads us to, to uh, conceptualizing our futures, you know? Um, so the, the, the way this turn, ties to terse, trans exclusion radical feminists, is that Turfs say, this is what a woman is. This is what she will be, and this is all that she is going to be. These are the rules for womanhood. So, uh, De Beauvoir then goes off of that, and then they state, no, rather, a woman is whatever she decides to be, mm. right? And so this allows a type of futurism to be like, this is what we will be. Because I, as a Tomoksakshe, I, as a Kwadwitekin, am always going to create what a Kwadwitekin person will be. Mm. So this leads us to futures. Afro-Indigenous futures, right? The conceptualizing of, like, even if there was no two-spirit people in our community, there are two-spirit now, and we have the sacred project, the sacred act of creating ceremonies for our Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous, queer people. We have a responsibility um, to cultivate new ceremonies. Mm. So... When we first landed into this place in this land, those were, you know, our ancestors. Our ancestors came to Potapatana, the, the blue hole in the garden where they saw it, and they were like, this is sacred. We must do something to remember how sacred this is. They ate the Pasher Peyote. They incorporated these ceremonies. Mm-hmm. That power, that Tamox, does not stop simply because they did it back then. That the moks, that power, still lays in us today to continue legacies of creating ceremony. And we cannot lose the sacred for the sake of ceremony, otherwise we're just continuing to act like churches all around us. Mm. You know, so like I'll say that means we cannot lose what is sacred for the acts of ceremonies. So this futures aspect, Afro-Indigenous futures, leads us um, towards confronting center, settler colonialism with new acts that are ceremonial, that are sacred, that are inclusive of the two-spirit people that are within us. And this is also, in my opinion, the responsibility of people in our communities is to be like, hey, we have two-spirit people in our, the Moksakcha people in our, in our area, like, how can we be cognizant of incorporating them? And that's not going to take away from our nativehood, that's not going to take away from our blackness. Rather, in my opinion, these are ways in which our blackness, our nativeness, is perpetuated. And so all of these things kind of tie together into the ideas of like dreaming, creating the visions of the future, what we will be. And so I want to encourage you guys today that you are, you know, native and black people, so many of you here, and that you have a spiritual connection, and that you as you are, will perpetuate and continue those sacred legacies that you Mm. should believe in yourself in this place, that Mm. you are welcome in this place. You've always been welcome in this land. You've always been accepted in this land. These waters have known you. The stop that he has known you. Both of Bhutan has known you, and it will never forget you. And so when we dream, let's remember to dream together, you know, and creating something better for all of us. Oh, this is awesome. This is the (laughs) power. Um, so if you want to go, if some of y'all want to like be aware of this thing, they have like a, a Zoom thing that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. Um, it's called Bates American Indian Two Spirits. It's cute. And uh, have you seen this movie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, make a distinction really quickly. You know, um, in my presentation. I started off with, um, you know, black folks in San Antonio, and the inception of San Antonio itself has come with, you know, um, segregation, essentially, um, even in the beginnings. 
And so um, at the end here, thinking about, you know, blackness in Yanawana, what does that look like? You know, we've never really had um, black folks here who have not been, uh, you know, under the oppression of whiteness, of white systems, of white ways of being, of white discrimination. Um, and so, yeah, thinking about our futures by, you know, really connecting to the land and understanding that um, we have the responsibility to build something that is more inclusive than San Antonio has ever been. Because this is not San Antonio, this is Yanawana, mm -hmm. like this land, you know, San Antonio is what was put on top of it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you guys so much, and let's see questions.